Good evening, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Kyle Hosier, principal of the Junior Senior High School. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm joined here with. Hi, I'm Mary Rose Joseph, assistant principal. Welcome. Hello, good evening. I'm Jennifer Johnson, assistant principal. Hi, everyone. Victoria Newell, superintendent of schools. Thanks for coming. We wanna uh, thank everyone for being here. Our agenda this evening, we first wanna talk a little bit about our goals and making a change at this point in the year. Give a reminder of our health and safety guidelines that have kept everyone safe on campus this year. Talk a little bit about the process that we've used so far to create the framework that you're about to hear about and identify the steps that we will take next. Talk a little bit about the options that we wanna provide students and families identify the challenges and talk a little bit about what those challenges are and then give some more information around the transition and lunch period. We know that there are a lot of questions about what the transition period would look like if students are on campus. So we do wanna provide some greater detail there. In the invitation that was shared with you, there was also a Google form that you can use to submit questions. So we encourage you to submit questions that you have. We do think a lot of questions will be answered throughout this presentation. So if you are inclined to submit questions, maybe you wanna wait more towards the end to see if the questions are answered, but feel free to uh, submit questions at any point. In terms of our goals, you know, first and foremost, we wanna maintain health and safety protocols on campus. To the best of our knowledge, we've had no transmission so far this year, and we wanna continue that. We know that the protocols that we've put into place have worked well and we wanna continue those. And we've actually added to them, which you'll hear a little bit more about later on. Families have very unique needs at this point and we wanna provide flexibility for students and families. This pandemic has been very difficult and having more flexibility we know is better than trying to have a, a strict um, schedule that everyone has to adhere to. So providing options is something that we know is important moving forward. And finally, we, we know that students have had great success with the hybrid model, but we also wanna offer a full day option for students who are looking for an opportunity to be on campus a little bit more. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Joseph to talk about health and safety. Thank you, Mr. Hozier. So as, as Mr. Hozier just mentioned that one of our, our principles of, of full day uh, learning is looking at health and safety. New York, uh, New York schools look at the DOH for mitigation strategies, and there's five mitigation strategies that we look at, um, and we've been enforcing that. If you've been following Board of Ed meetings, you've been hearing Anthony DeRosa talk about how we are an example in the Lower Hudson Valley. The first strategy is masking. All students are asked to wear masks at all times, except for when they're eating, um, and we've enforced that, and, and we see students actually doing that. Physical distancing has been one of the strategies as well. All students sit six feet apart, um, and if it's a different type of class, sometimes it's actually 12 feet, depending on the actual class. Um, recently, CDC talked about the fact that it could be as less as uh, three feet, as long as there's a barrier in place. So guidelines are changing as we get more and more data. Every single classroom is stocked with sanitizers and hand wipes and students are asked to make sure they practice washing hands and respiratory hygiene. We clean our facilities during transition and also improve ventilation by changing some of the filtration systems that actually align with our infrastructure. And we open windows whenever the weather is obviously nice. We've always been contact tracing and quarantining based on the, the, their test results and exposure, but recently we started surveillance testing. We just started on Monday. Uh, Ms. Johnson can talk, to, talk more about that if you have questions, but every single test result has been negative thus far. And we've been making sure that students are, um, and our transmission at schools also has been zero. So, we believe our strategies have been working in terms of health and safety, and we hope to continue to do, uh, to do that. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to Mr. Hosier to talk about the process. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. So we, we've had a number of meetings that have taken place to develop the framework that you're about to hear about. We've met with GO, our student leadership. I've had numerous meetings with my principal's advisory committee, three or four meetings with our leadership team, multiple faculty meetings, met with the T PTSA board members and have almost daily conversations with district and school level administrators. Moving forward, we will meet with students tomorrow at 3.30 to give them a little more information about the plan and to hear their feedback. We wanna, wanna also collect feedback from you and hear your ideas uh, using a survey that will go out tonight. We will use that survey information to finalize our plan 
And that plan will then be shared in greater detail at the Board of Education meeting on Tuesday, March 23rd. Our hope is to, to ask families to make a uh, commitment to their cohort by Tuesday, April 6th. And then we would bring back all students who wanna come back full day by the end of April. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Johnson to talk a little bit about the specific options that are offered to students. Thank you, Mr. Hosier. Um, so as has been stated already, we realize that it's very important to students and families to continue to provide flexibility and options for all families to meet your unique needs. And that is what we are striving to do with our plan to bring more students back to campus. With this plan, students can offer remote instruction, full day instruction, stay on hybrid instruction as best meets their individual and your family needs. You can continue to schedule pickup and drop off around free periods. For example, if your student doesn't have a class for block A, you can continue to drop them off for block B. Similarly, you can pick them up whenever they are ready to leave school. We recognize that um, having said all of that about options that many, if not most of our students would benefit from full day in-person instruction. And our goal is to bring back as many students for that as possible. As I've said, families and students will still have the option to be fully remote, to be hybrid, or to come back full day. Many people have asked, why don't we simply go back to a nine period day? And really the answer is because that does not allow for a hybrid option. We know so far it's worked very well to have students leave during the transition to go home for lunch, um, and then to come back for either hybrid or in-person learning. With a nine period day, we don't have that option. And we also know that many families now we're in March, they have a set schedule that is working for them. And we don't want to take away that flexibility in those options. And finally, we know that many families do not want their students to eat lunch on campus. They've shared that they think it's safer that students return home um, to eat, and then they can come back to school for PM learning. And now I will turn it back to Ms. Joseph. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, with any new change or change in plan comes some challenges. What have been some of our highlights will also pose as challenges with this new plan. So the transition period was really a highlight for our plan. It allowed students to, to leave campus um, to prepare for the next cohort. It allowed for students to stay on campus if they were full day but it is a 72 minute block. Um, so how is it a challenge for us with this new plan? We have to think about how, how will we provide meaningful opportunities for students to engage in the content, engage with their peers through socialization, but also maintain health and safety protocols. So although it's, it's a benefit, it's also a challenge for us to think about and plan. And Mr. Hoja will talk more about what we're thinking in terms of that. Ms. Johnson spoke to how we've been flexible with families based on cohorts. You could choose to go remote given a family need. And we will continue to, to adhere to that. But is there benefit to have consistency of cohorts? There is benefit. If we know where the kids are on campus, when they're there, it helps us to know where they are and have supervision and have appropriate activities, et cetera. So the consistency of cohorts will be a challenge to make sure that we, have, um, we know where the students are at all times. Transportation will also be a challenge for us in some ways. We, we realize that some parents cannot pick up and drop off at different times in the day. So, that will pose as a challenge in terms of how many kids are on campus. Um, and finally, the unknowns. We don't know how many parents are interested in this option. We don't know if it's if it's 200 or more. And, and how will our plan change and evolve based on some of those unknowns being answered? So I'm going to uh, pass it to Mr. Hozier to talk more about what the plan could look like based on our, our current understanding. Thank you, Ms. Joseph. So as a reminder, our transition period is 72 minutes long. It occurs from 1114 to 1226. And we built this transition period into the schedule because we wanted students who were in the AM cohort to be able to go home and have lunch, students who were in the PM cohort to have lunch at home and then come to campus. We also use the transition time to disinfect the campus and for faculty and staff to collaborate with each other. And, and as Ms. Joseph said, we feel like the transition period has added a lot to the schedule that we had this year. The, we, we are planning on keeping the AM PM schedule, which means we would keep the transition period. So it provides students the option if they wanted to, to go home for lunch 
or to stay on campus. We expect that likely upperclassmen will tend to leave and younger junior high students will likely stay on campus at higher rates than upperclassmen. We will provide an opportunity for students to have campus on lunch and part of having lunch on campus would be to offer a limited lunch option, which will probably a be a cold option for students. We're still working on what that menu would look like and we'll share that information once we have it, but we will have a lunch option for students on campus. And as the weather gets warmer and hopefully we have nice weather, we will look to use the outside space as much as possible during the transition period. You wouldn't know it today because it's very cold, but nicer weather is around the corner. So to get a little more detailed with our planning, we just wanna give you a sense of what activities we will have during the transition period for students. So we know that some seventh and eighth grade students may decide to go home during the transition. If parents can drop them off before the transition and then um, bring them back to campus, we understand that that might happen for some seventh and eighth graders. We also know that many seventh and eighth graders will stay on campus. So if students are gonna have lunch, our plan currently is for students to have a 26 minute lunch period, where if the weather's not nice, we can have students sit six feet apart in the San Marco gym and the LGI. When the weather is nice, we can offer a space in the San Marco gym, LGI in the upper fields. And we would encourage students to eat outside on the upper field where they can really spread out, be able to see each other. And again, it's a 26 minute lunch. All of those spaces will be supervised during the transition period. At 1140, the expectation would be everyone would put their mask on, lunch is over, and we'd have a number of opportunities for students. With intramurals, we'd have extra help, opportunity to stay on the field and socialize if they'd like to, or go back to the San Marco gym, get some work done, uh, maybe use that as a study hall. We expect to offer clubs as well during the transition period. And we have some ideas to offer a movie in the LGI that might tie to the work that students are doing in class. So we think with this, all of these different options, 45 minutes will likely go by very fast. And from a parent's perspective, we know one of the concerns is what does supervision look like? Because teachers are not teaching during the transition period, we do have a number of teachers who are available to help supervise. And so all of the places listed on this PowerPoint, we would have teachers there or aides there to help supervise. So that's, that's really seventh and eighth graders. And the goal is to try to keep some separation between grade seven and eight and then upperclassmen. If you have a student who's at a high school level, again, lunch would look very similar. Lunch would be from 1114 to 1140. Now, we do know a number of high school students will leave and we encourage students to leave if, if they feel safer having lunch at home. But we know we wanna, again, offer the option to stay on campus for upperclassmen. So lunch would take place for students in grades nine through 12 in the cafeteria, in the courtyard, in the library, and in the breezeways. We also um, benefit from the breezeways because if we do have rain, the breezeways provide an area for students to be outside that are covered. Extra help from 1140 to 1225 would be offered, as well as opportunities to socialize with friends, complete work in the library, and again, engage in clubs for the last 45 minutes of the transition period. And again, all of these activities would be supervised during the transition period. We um, are looking at a couple of different options to add to this. Uh, we recently contacted the uh, Greenberg Nature Center to see if they might be able to partner with us. And we're hoping, although it's not on the list, we're hoping that that might be another option that we can offer during the transition period. All right, with that, I'm sure we have a lot of questions that parents have. So Ms. Johnson, maybe we could start looking at questions. And again, if, if you do have questions, please use the Google form that was shared in my email earlier today. And it's the same Google form that was shared over the weekend. I'll stop sharing my screen. Great, and ready for the first question when you are. Okay, so the first question is wondering what has changed as far as infection rates and guidelines? Is the intention to replace the current hybrid model entirely and only offer fully remote or fully in-person? So we, we know that we've had some success this year and we don't wanna completely dismantle what has worked well. So hopefully you get the sense that we wanna build on that success. So we are gonna keep the remote option, keep the hybrid option, 
But we also know that we have some students who really want to be on campus full day and would benefit from being on campus full day. And we also want to try to get as many students back on campus as possible. For students who've been fully remote, it's going to, going to be very difficult to make the transition in September. It will likely be a little bit easier if they spend some time on campus near the end of the year. And, and I guess in, in terms of what is different, I think we know a lot more now than we did in September. The transmission's not happening on campus. We know that when students wash their hands, when they wear a mask, um, when they follow some of the guidance that we've been given and students to their credit have done a fantastic, fantastic job with that. We don't see transmission on campus. We also have uh, testing that's happening now and we can see more and more members of the community being uh, given the vaccine. Okay, the next question is, um, are students going to have a new schedule if not, what will free periods, study hall, and the transition time look like? If they eat at school, how will you ensure social distancing without masks? And we are uh, not changing the schedule, so we're going to stick with AM, PM schedule, so student schedules will not change. We're trying to use outdoor space as much as possible during the lunch periods. Students are permitted to go home if that works better for them. But if students do stay on campus, we've identified a number of places for students to eat and they would have to maintain a minimum of six feet separation in order to have lunch on campus. The, um, the question of what do we do if someone has a free period in the beginning of the day or at the end of the day, students could still come in at the start of B block or leave at the end of E block if they have a free at the end of the day. Now, if you have a free and wanna stay on campus, we do have the library, we do have the San Marco gym, we do have the cafeteria. If you have a study hall, we have had teachers in their study halls throughout the years. So we have places for students to be on campus. Great, I think you just answered the next question, which was about students who might have a free period or a lunch period adjacent to either the beginning of the day, the transition or the end of the day. Would students still be able to come in late or leave early? Yes, they can. And again, just to give as much flexibility as possible, students can come in late or if they decide that they wanna come in and get work done, that's also an option. Great. The next question is, where will students be during the transition period? Will they have the choice to go home or stay at school during the transition period every day? Or do they have to choose one option for the rest of the school year? So that, that's a great question. I wanna um, add a little more detail before I answer that specifically. In some of our conversations with faculty and staff and then with the PTSA board members and with students, the question of how do we handle students who go day-to-day -day remote or who want to change their schedule on a daily basis. And I, I think um, originally we thought we would have a little more commitment and not allow students to go remote day by day. And as we talked with students and as we talked with parents and had conversations with faculty, I think we got the sense that, yes, it's difficult to plan when you don't know how many students are going to be in your classroom. At the same time, families need that flexibility right now. If you have an event that's coming up and you're worried about being quarantined, let's say SAT or, or a, a, a wedding, there are different things that you say like, I just can't be on campus. Or if you have transportation issues one day, it makes it difficult to commit fully. So we would have some flexibility. Now, the key with the transition period is how we structure the transition time is gonna look very different if we have 200 students who are on campus during the transition versus if we have 700 students. So we would ask families to try to commit to the best of their ability and expect some flexibility within that commitment. That leads right into the next question. If a family does say they do wanna come back for a full day, but then they become uncomfortable with that option, can they go back to either hybrid or fully remote? Yes, we don't want to have any students or families in a position that they're uncomfortable with. We, we do encourage students who are remote to think about coming back on campus because there are, um, again, I think teachers will be, be very happy to see more students. There's this social aspect of being able to see your friends on campus. And there's a level of academic support that's just a little greater when you're in the classroom. 
but but if someone goes full day and they decide hybrid or, or remote works better, we would allow families to, to move to that. Great. The next question is about lunch. Can parents decide, for example, if the weather is nice to have their kids stay at school and eat lunch? And if the weather is not nice, pick them up to eat at home and then be brought back to school? Can they change day by day? You know, my sense what's driving that question is a desire to make sure that if students are on campus for lunch, that they're outside. So I think we would expect there to be some change on, on days where the weather is problematic. And honestly, um, if more students go home, that means there's more space for students to spread out during the transition period if the weather is bad. So yes, we would understand parents taking that approach. Another question about lunch. Will students be able to sit with their friends or will they have to eat in an assigned spot? We want to start with one of the things that's missing so much this year is that ability to socialize. We have some students who, you know, are in the AM cohort who have never seen students in the PM cohort. So we don't think we would start with an assigned spot. However, um, students do need to be seated while they have lunch. They need to be six feet apart. And if we start to run into any issues with that, we would have to increase the structure that we put into place. I don't think that that's gonna be an issue, but that could be an option we pursue if we start to have any issues with that. We have a comment from a parent that's concerned that we want students to come back full day, yet we are still only offering six blocks of instruction per day. So we, um, we, we do want students to come back full day. And we've actually had a number of students who've been full day since the beginning of the year for, for one reason or another. And I think in speaking with those students, they've appreciated that option. So in order for us to make a decision, if we don't, if we wanna increase from six periods to nine, we'd have to drastically change the schedule for the remainder of the year. And given the information we have, the appreciation for the hybrid approach, the ability for students to go home during lunch, and if you have more periods in a day, you're actually interacting with a greater number of students and there's more transition across the campus because students don't stay in one cohort. And we know we're headed in a better place, but we're not fully out of the pandemic yet. And we don't wanna to make too big of a change that would put people at risk when, when we, we don't need to do that to offer a full day option. The next question is about who is able to leave campus for lunch? Do parents have to sign something? Does it depend on certain rules for who can go off campus for lunch? And so typically, and, and again, everything's different during a pandemic, we would not allow underclassmen to leave for lunch. We would send a Google form and part of the Google form, one, one question will ask about um, a child being able to leave during the transition period. And so anyone who indicates that their child has permission to leave would be permitted to leave during the transition period. There's a question about what a, a day at school would look like for a full day student. Would these start and end times be the same? Yes, so 8.38, first period starts and the day ends at 3.02. Except if you have a free or a study hall first period or last period, again, there's flexibility to arrive at the start of B block or uh, leave before the, the last period if you have a free. The next question is about families that have more than one child at the junior senior high school. Do they have to make one decision for all of their children? Good question. Uh, no, we know that different students have different needs. So even with the family, within one family, we'd wanna provide some flexibility there. Great, the next question is about students who might have a free or a lunch next to the transition. Um, the parent says that's a lot of time and they're worried their child does not have enough homework to fill up that time. What would they do with that? So the free that would be adjacent to the transition, we would treat as, as though it's a study hall. So it's supervised, students would be at their desk. And then during the transition, hopefully you can see that we have a lot of options there. So it's not as though students would have nothing to do. They would have 26 minutes to have lunch and then they have a, a number of different activities that they can engage in. The next question is about during class time and the plan for seating, if there are more kids in class. Um, this parent points out that their children are concerned they might sit in somebody else's seat by mistake. 
So we, um, many classrooms right now have 15 to 17 desks. And we know that we will move more desks into classrooms. The, the guidance from uh, the Department of Health has said since September, you can be six feet with a mask or under six feet with a mask and a barrier. So there are some classes that if we have a number of students who come back that would be closer than six feet, but we would provide a barrier for those, those rooms and students would have masks. Um, I, I think in terms of sitting in someone else's seat, again, there's some flexibility. Um, so we don't have assigned seats. Some teachers do. If they do, that's largely because it would help with contact tracing, but I wouldn't worry too much about sitting in someone's seat. The next question is about um, what if a student only has one class in the morning blocks or in the afternoon blocks? Can they still do that one class remotely? Yes, uh, we have some students who are, who are using that approach. And again, I, I think um, we'd love to have more students on campus, but we're not going to limit the ability to go remote day by day, given the information we have right now. The next question wonders if there is a critical mass of students that once we hit a certain number, it would switch to everybody full day on campus. So I think we're curious to see what the survey results show. We expect to have a number of students who want to continue to be hybrid. The options that we're describing now with remote, hybrid, and full day, I think it's unlikely that we wouldn't continue to offer all, each of those through the remainder of the year. If it becomes clear that more people want to come back full day, then we would leave that option open for families who choose that option. Ms. Joseph, be ready. Whatever the next question is, it's coming your way. Okay, I think you've already answered this one, but I think it's important to repeat. The question is, if a parent opts for a certain cohort and it's not working, can they switch later? I mean, uh, Mr. Hosier said this, I think we definitely wanna make sure we cater to the family's needs. So if you need to be remote one day because of transportation or sickness, then it will be an option. So. The answer is yes, you can switch. Thank you. The next question is about locker rooms. Will they be open for sports? Dr. Newell, do you wanna take that? I don't know the newest guidance from Mr. DeRosa. Sure, as of right now, the locker rooms are not open. Um, so none of the sports are utilizing locker rooms. I don't expect that to change in the near future, but we'll be following the guidance on that as well. Thank you. The next question we have already answered, but I do think it's important to repeat. The question is, can students have lunch at home some days and lunch on campus other days, depending on what works for them? Ms. Johnson, do you wanna take that? Can you just say it a little bit differently than I had? Sure, I'd be delighted to. The, the easy answer is yes. We really want this to be flexible and to work for all families, so absolutely. You can decide to pick up your children for lunch if that works for you on a particular day, or they can stay and have lunch at school if that works on a different day. Okay, let me go get the next question. If all students return to school, is social distancing a realistic option? If we had a thousand, all, almost thousand students coming back in April, uh, I, I think we would have to look at our plan and make some changes. We don't expect that to happen. We know that a number of students have said that they wanna go remote for the remainder of the year. We believe a number of students will wanna stay with the hybrid approach. So we think that this will work with the number of students who plan to come back, but we, that's one of the reasons why we're doing the survey before we finalize the plan to, to get a better sense of how many students would like to come back. Next question is from a parent who says that his or her child has a lunch period in their schedule. How would that work? What would the child do during that lunch period? So that lunch period is, and again, if, if your child has a lunch period, there, there may be 200 students who have lunch during that time, but we also have almost 800 students who have classes during that time. So if you have a lunch period, that lunch period, if you're 
uh, a seventh or eighth grader, you would that would be a supervised time. We'd identify where you would go for that time. It would have a study hall feel to it. Upperclassmen would have the option of going to the cafeteria, using a space that's outside, the San Marco gym, or the library to get some work done. The next question is about class size. If most students come back, is there a limit to class size? Part of our, our uh, approach moving forward will be to have work with custodians when they move desk into classrooms and then to identify our largest rooms where let's say we do have a class where we have 24 students. We're asking for families to let us know what their plans are. Uh, we will send out a different survey where families are asked to commit to a cohort and to make that commitment by April 6th. That gives us over just over a week to identify which classrooms we'd have to move if we had to move any. We do expect that there, you know, at probably classes will be slightly larger at the junior high level than at the high school level. The next question is whether we can provide an update about how many faculty and staff have been vaccinated. Dr. Newell, would you like to take that? Uh, yes, um, at, as a whole, I don't have the breakdown by um, employee group, but as of now, we're about 50% vaccinated. That's taking all employee groups across the district. Thank you. The next question is again about free periods around transition. This parent asks if it's on if it they're free on different days, can they come home early, go home early? Um, how would that work? Yes, and so if you have a, a a day of the cycle where you have lunch that's before the transition period, we understand that a family may say, "Okay, I'm going to pick up my child. It's a little extra time to spend with them at home. They can have lunch at home." Whereas if you just have the transition period. You, the student might, might stay on campus. So yes, there's flexibility there. Again, we're looking for some consistency as much as possible. So we don't have 100 students on campus during the transition one day and then 700 the next. So within that range, yes, we, we're, we can be flexible with expectations. The next question I think is an advertisement for a future meeting, but the parents said, is this the meeting where we will discuss final exams in regions or is that another meeting? Timely question because we just got some more information from the state. We know that a lot of families are trying to make plans end of June and are really looking for a schedule to be released. Please know that we, we know that there's that urgency. We just got another update from the state. So we're hoping to be able to share an update in the very near future. We know the families need that information. The next question is about lockers. If students come back full day, would they be able to use lockers on campus? No, we haven't discussed lockers yet. I think that's when we meet with students tomorrow, that's one of the things we'll talk about to try to decide if, if it would be helpful to offer lockers as an option. I think I'll just take the next question because again, it's about free periods in the day. A parent points out that on certain days of the cycle, their child may have three hours free. Can they do different things on different days? And yes, absolutely. Depending on the day of the cycle and your child's schedule, they can come in late, they can leave early, they can go home for lunch. The reason we're doing this in, most, in some part is to maintain flexibility for each family. So you can absolutely do that. The next question is, will teachers require students um, who, are, who are not in person to come in person on test days? No, students who are remote won't be required to take exams in person. Every teacher or every department may have a slightly different approach, but there's not an expectation if you're remote that you would have to come in to take exams in person. The next question is about quarantine. Do we anticipate that there might be more students and faculty that would be required to quarantine because of the greater number of students on campus? Our approach right now has been, if we have an individual who tests positive, part of the contact tracing, if it's a student, is to identify the students who are adjacent to the student 
in each of the student's classes. So if you are, um, if you test positive and you're a student, most of our desks are right around six feet. So out of an abundance of caution, anyone who's adjacent to that student, we do quarantine. If you think that desk will now be, you know, three, four or five feet a, a, apart, I think the same approach would be used that anyone who's adjacent to that student would have to quarantine. However, we wouldn't then have to go to students who are two desks away. It's just the students who are adjacent to the one who tests positive. So it's possible that we would have more students who would have to quarantine if there are more students in the room, because if you're in the center of the room, you have those eight desks around the person who tests positive, any one of those desks would have to test positive. At the same time, if you remember at the beginning of the school year, anyone in the classroom would have to quarantine. So we expect that the numbers wouldn't be anything close to what we saw in, in the fall. Thank you. The next question is about if a student does decide to come back full day, but for whatever reason they need to attend remotely on one particular day, would they still have to email all their teachers and let them know? It's helpful for teachers to know who will be on campus and who will be remote. So we would ask that uh, parents continue to email teachers to let them know if they're gonna be remote on a given day, if they're supposed to be on campus that day. The next question is about spring sports. Will they proceed as usual or will there be a modified schedule? Dr. Newell, do you wanna take that? So um, I don't have a lot of details on spring sports at the moment. Uh, we just kicked off our fall two sports season of uh, football, swimming and volleyball. Uh, so uh, we, we will be getting out additional information on spring sports shortly. When is the full day option for high school plan to start? The uh, option will be available for all students no later than the end of April. And we hope to be able to give the specific timeline at Tuesday's board meeting. Here's a good question and it's about next fall. Do we anticipate that most students will be back to school in one cohort full day in the fall? We certainly hope so. Uh, you know, I think every time we have more students come back, we start to feel more of like, oh, this is school. There's that energy. You, you hear students laugh and there's there, that, that excitement. So we want to be optimistic that things will look more normal in the fall. And, and I, I believe that they will. I don't know that we're in a position to say that we wouldn't offer a remote cohort or that we would. We know that um, there's a lot, long time between now and then but we do expect that if we had any students who would be remote, it'd be far fewer than what we have now. And it would look more like a typical school year. Here's an important question for our juniors and seniors. What about student parking policy as more students are asked to come back to campus? So we, we met with seniors uh, last week and heard one senior comment that there weren't enough parking spaces and that there's you know concern that maybe juniors are starting to park on campus. So we don't allow juniors to park on campus right now. They do have the option to park on artillery and, and um, some students park on old colony. When seniors move to uh, senior options, we would allow juniors to park on campus that, at that point. And we'll share more information as we, that date gets closer. The next question is about uh, if a student does come back full day, is there a place they can leave their sports equipment while they're in class so they don't have to carry it around all day? I think that's a good question that would drive the decision of whether we would allow lockers or not. So um, to full, full transparency, we haven't talked much about lockers, but that will be one of the next things that we discuss. The next question is about the cafeteria. Will it offer food for purchase? Yes, Ms. Joseph, do you want to take that one? Yeah, we will be offering food, but it'll be a limited option. It'll be probably a cold lunch pickup, no hot foods available. That's the plan as of now. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is about the hybrid schedule. Will it remain exactly the same as it is now? We do not plan on changing the schedule for the last two months of the school year. And again, we, we just 
know that it has worked well for some families and that many families have created a structure and to upend all of that now just doesn't seem like the right approach. The next question is about testing, specifically whether teachers can require all of those students who are not fully remote to take tests in person. Teachers have discretion over how they administer exams. And part of that discretion is to have students take exams in the classroom if they're in person. We, um, we're mindful that we don't want students, we don't wanna see a trend where students tend to go remote on days that we have exams. That, that is a problem. We wanna make sure that that doesn't happen. So some teachers have said that if you are in person, you, you're expected to take the test while you're on campus. Here's a question about our COVID surveillance testing program. Approximately how many students have consented to random testing so far? Dr. Niniwal, do you want to take that, if you know? I actually don't have the total. Jen, do you know the total? I don't have the exact total here, but I would estimate that it is over, definitely over 100, maybe close to 200. Thanks. The next question is about finals and regions and the information. We are trying to get that to you as soon as we can. So please stay tuned for that. The next question is about vaccination. If a child is vaccinated, will he or she still have to quarantine? So um, I'm happy to I'm happy to answer that one. This has been been a new one for us. And um, any faculty member or student who is fully vaccinated and is more than two weeks out of the second vaccine, if it, they require two vaccines. Uh, does not have to quarantine if they are considered a close contact. Here's a really important question about our seventh graders and it's definitely something that's on our mind. Do we have any plans for seventh graders who haven't had a chance to meet the majority of the kids in their grade and they didn't have a proper orientation this year? That's a great example of why we wanna offer the full day option so students can get to uh, know each other. And you know, we have students probably from Sealy or from Greenville that don't know uh, students who entered or, or came from the other elementary school. So yes, we wanna have that option. We're also mindful to think about what would orientation, uh, a second orientation look like for students who are in the seventh grade. And, and we're having those conversations. The next question is whether kids will receive an email about tomorrow's meeting that we're hosting for students. That email went out earlier today, yes, with the link, uh, and again, that's at 3.30. The final question we have so far is, if a student goes back to campus full-time, do they still have to submit their assignments on Google Classroom? Our uh, teachers have done a, a great job of transitioning to Google Classroom. I think that question is best answered by speaking to the individual teacher. My sense though is that yes, teachers have found a lot of success using Google Classroom. We also know when there's consistency ac across classrooms that makes it a little bit easier for students. So my hunch is that the answer is yes, but best to talk to the, the teacher. That was our last question, Mr. Hosier. Right, so we will share a recording of this video. We will share the uh, PowerPoint presentation and a survey later tonight. And please, um, please take the time to uh, fill out the survey for each of your uh, children. And if you have friends, encourage them to fill out the survey. It just gives us the information that we need to uh, finalize the plan to make sure that the plan will work. The more information, the more ideas we have, the better. We want to thank you for taking the time to complete that survey. If you do have other questions that come up, please feel free to contact us, email, email call. We want to answer any questions that you have. And as always, part of our ability to stay open is based on all the work that you're doing in the community to keep everyone safe. So please continue to follow health guidelines. We are looking forward to a time when the pandemic is behind us. We're close, but we're not quite out of it yet. So let's keep working together. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.